Eddie Bozio. Thank you for joining us for our third live TV collective masterclass here at Ravensbourne College. Tonight we're joined by Barbara Emile. Now Barbara's one of the UK's most experienced television executives. She's a BAFTA winning producer who's led top mainstream productions like EastEnders and Holby City. Now Barbara's currently working with Lenny Henry's new company Douglas Road Productions where she's developing talent from the black and Asian communities. She's here to offer advice to writers on how to create powerful storylines and to production executives on how to progress in today's TV industry. We've got an audience of TV Collective members here in the studio with us. And you can also join the conversation through Twitter. Just use the hashtag TVC Masterclass. So, Barbara, welcome. Can you tell us what you're up to with Lenny Henry? OK, well, it's a development company as opposed to a production company at the moment and what we're doing is basically developing drama, um, some documentaries, factual entertainment and the odd comedy. Odd comedy. The odd comedy. An That's unusual a, comedy. Yes, one or two. Um, and yes, I mean what our ambition is to work with the best writers, um, best on-screen talent and to nurture and develop talent behind the camera especially. Hmm. So you know, and we, what we hope is eventually we will use a diverse group of um, writers, reflect diversity in front of camera and behind the camera. So is it specifically targeting black and Asian, or the, all the diverse communities, as opposed to just any old production com uh, development company? I guess so. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that that is our modus operandi, but I think as producers, that is what we're about. Hmm. I've never sought to do anything else. So... Um, but in the current climate, we thought rather than just talk about it, we'll actually try and do it. So. And, and this is a development company. How hmm. does that differ from a production company? Oh, well, <laughs> basically, we're coming up with ideas or working with writers, take them, the ideas to a, a treatment script stage, pitch them. And then if we go into production, we pair up with a, an established production company. It's a way, we think that that's the most efficient way of getting as many productions off ground as possible. And so will uh, Douglas Road feed into Crucial, which is Lenny Henry's established production company? Um, at this point, we haven't got plans to do so, but you never know. I mean, we could actually take over the world, you never know. <laughs> Well, it seems that your career has been geared towards that. Can you take us back to the beginning? How did you get into the industry? And then we'll work out how you got to where you are today. <laughs> well, that's a very long, <laughs> long tale. Are you sure you want to know? Um, OK, I started as a runner. I literally have done most jobs, probably very badly. I started as, um, after college, I started as a runner. I was um, for a commercials company. Mm -hmm a very bad runner because I kept losing my way yeah. um, uh, and then I became production <laughs> assistant. So even the audience thinks yes, it's I funny. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> production <laughs> assistant, a coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot. I literally learned a lot. Not particularly how to do my job well but I learned about everybody else's job. Uh, I was a researcher and basically the way I got into drama if you like was as a reader. Mm -hmm. um, which is something that's not as current anymore, but it was a fantastic way because I read uh, for various companies, scripts, books, um, you know, one page pitch documents, ideas. Um, and what I would do is write reports on, you know, basically a synopsis of the project, um, what was good about the project, what was weak, where it could be placed, whether it was uh, suitable for co production, which is my area of it. Of, expertise in a way um, and that way I worked for many many companies finding out what they were developing what they were looking for and getting a really really clear idea of what broadcasters would commission so that's how I started and then a very very nice person at the BBC possibly misguided said I know where you should be you should be on a long runner you should join EastEnders go off and be interviewed and that's where you really cut your teeth and learn you know how to become a producer and that's what I did. So you started out at the BBC as a producer, an assistant producer? No, as, as, a, as, a, no, as, a, um, as a script editor. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. So everything before that was basically for the independent sector. So I started as a um, script editor and learned a hell of a lot.
mm -hmm. you know, an output of 50 weeks a year, 50, you know, and at the time it was two times a week, then three times a week. So what were the storylines you were dealing with at the time on EastEnders when oh you joined? God. What was happening? Um, was it Dirty Den? Was that the time? No, that Dirty Den was before my time. Um, Mark uh, Fowler, HIV oh, yeah. storyline, um, the beginnings of Sharon Grant and Phil's relationship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was an exciting time. I was script editor for about oh, eight to ten months and I got in every morning at six o'clock in the morning and learnt my job. Hmm. Literally, between 6 a.m. and when we started shooting, I literally learnt my job because I really wasn't sure what I was doing. Um, <laughs> but uh, I learnt a lot. And then about um, eight, ten months later, I became a producer mm -hmm. and helped establish a writer-led system. What's that? Basically, all storylines, every single episode, every single idea was generated by writers. Mm -hmm. No storyliners whatsoever. It was me, basically. Mm. Um, and it was a great system. So we had about 25 writers who were on contract, mm -hmm. who were our, our A team. Then we had a B team, C team, and D team. And the T D team were shadow writers who were paid to write the same episodes as the A team. Mm -hmm. So they would go through exactly the same process with the same amount of um, time, same uh, challenges, let's mm -hmm. say, in terms of location, time, cast, and they would write, go through the system right the way through to the um, final script and be able to compare their script to the script that was actually shot. Oh, and it was a great system because the A team um, basically mentored the D team. Mm. Um, so great relationships were um, forged working relationships and you know after that the D team would become the C and the C would become the B. So there are writers now working on EastEnders who were in the C and D team when I was there. And who are now main writers. And, mm. so and does great... that system still exist? No, not in that form. Um, the output's four times a week. It's mm. very, very hard. And, and you know it was great for its time. We mm. knew we were going to um, three times a week and I actually became series producer, exec producer during that period. Again, learnt my job very quickly and uh, early in the morning again. Um, and we knew that we wanted storylines to bank storylines for two years ahead because actually taking a, a, a show as successful as that from two to three times a week, you absolutely had to guarantee that you could sustain the um, audience. Mm and that you would have enough stories because any number of things could go wrong. And you know, Such so as, we did. give us an example. Of no, it. I will not. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, obviously cast members can fall ill or become pregnant when they're supposed to not <laughs> be pregnant or whatever, you know, or need to leave the show for various mm. reasons. So um, it was a way, it was a good time. I mean, it was, it was fascinating actually working with the writers to plan two years ahead. Mm. And what it did was give the writers the scope to come up with fantastic stories that would run for a year or two. So Tony Jordan went home one fine day and decided that in a year's time, Sharon would sleep with her brothers, you know, <laughs> with her husband's brother. Yeah. You know, and um, we were able to in, uh, cast um, Peggy Mitchell, so Barbara Windsor, you know, expand the cast because we literally had to expand the cast by 50%, if you can imagine it, yeah. rebuild the lot for 50% increased capacity. Yeah. It was a crazy, crazy time, but it worked. Hmm. So, hmm. And how long were you with EastEnders then? Oh, about four or five years. Hmm. Hmm. So I was exhausted by the end. I was, it was great. It was a great experience. And we, you know, during that time, we were also able to bring on a, a shadow director scheme. Mm. as well so I, I had the luxury of being able to meet directors who had never been in a studio before but had done some really great theatre and say come shadow learn and then do. So what was it that made you not only deliver the programme but look to expand across the industry directors and training writers what was that about? Um, I think it was about opportunity. I mean, for me, I literally, you know, as I say, I started at the bottom, I worked my way up, I didn't have the traditional education or experience, and I was aware that there were a lot of people in my situation. Uh, furthermore, I think, you know, well, I have to say that when I, first time of being um, in a room, 
with writers and script editors, I was the only person from a, of colour. Mm -hmm. And that really sort of hit home to me and I realised, well, there's so many talented people out there. They just, they're not getting the opportunity and the people on the shows did not know they existed. So mm -hmm. it was a way of sort of bridging that gap. And it, I mean, I, I tried as best I could to go for absolute diversity, including um, regional. You know, I was amazed how many people would come to see me and, and they would say, you know, I'm from Northern Ireland and someone said I could, should come and see you, you know. Um, but it was good, yeah, but I think it was important and I think it continues to be important in the industry. And looking at the current state of the industry, you're talking about mm. a time in the... Yes, well, it's not polite to go back <laughs> that far. <laughs> how much change have you seen in, in well, we've got the big mm. debate about diversity at the mm. moment. Um, I think there's been a lot of change. Mm. I think there's a lot of positive developments that have happened in the industry. But what is shocking to me is behind camera, it hasn't progressed as much as I thought. I, when I, I you know, chopped and changed in terms of work post EastEnders. Um, and I decided many years later to go back into production because mm. I had been in development for some time. I'd taken a break from the industry. So when I went back to work on Holby, I wanted to produce again. I literally wanted to roll my sleeves up. Mm. I was absolutely amazed mm. that I still walked in, you know, in the building and I was one of very few. Okay. And that was disappointing to me, actually. Let's take you from that disappointment back to mm. working on EastEnders and the success you enjoyed there, because you mm. ended up with a BAFTA. I, the BAFTA was for Holby, actually. Was it for Holby? But, but for EastEnders, it was, it was a great time. Mm. I mean, it was a collective effort, let me say, mm. you know, working with a group of writers that were absolutely fantastic mm. and storylines, some amazing stories with me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we still pull down audiences of 23 million. One of the challenges I will share with you is that mm. when I first arrived as a script editor, I was party to a discussion whereby many of the writers were saying that it was still a challenge to create an Asian family and avoid um, them running the corner shop and yeah. having stories about arranged marriages. Mm. And one of my successes that I hope was a success was actually creating three characters running a storyline and actually having a bet with someone that I could get 23 bums on seats <laughs> to watch those characters in a love triangle. And at the night we got 23 million. Mm. I was uh, really, really proud and very, very pleased. And, and establishing that family in EastEnders, mm. how difficult was that? Not difficult at all as far as I was concerned. They were just was there much resistance? No. No, it was great. It was absolutely, the writers were absolutely, all they want to do, all any writer wants to do, is write fantastic characters. The more stories, the more challenging, the more entertainment, that's what they want. They don't, you know. So it was great. It was absolutely brilliant, you know. Okay, then you took, you left EastEnders, took mm. a break to raise your children. No, I actually went on to, I left EastEnders mm -hmm. and became an exec producer of the series department which again, I didn't know what I was doing, but there was a fine... Is that the way to progress your career? Take on something where you don't no, know what you're doing? It, it, no, not at all, but it's just that I think I came in in a different, you know, it was mm. a different time. Mm. Um, I wasn't aware of any training schemes. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I was just allowed to do my job and progress. I mean, that said, obviously I had accrued a hell of a lot of experience doing other jobs badly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, I mean, for EastEnders, one of my qualifications was actually running a market store myself. So, really? <laughs> yes. With, I had run with a, a view to what? What to well, understanding? I, no, 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 no. Um, before I got into the in industry, mm -hmm. I did many, many jobs and one of them was running a market store. So at my interview, um, I was asked, did I have any pertinent experience? And I said, running a market store, yeah. as opposed to working on any of the long running shows. Yeah. I was very lucky. Tony Jordan was there at the time and Tony had run a market store. Yeah. He was a market trader who started writing. So he recognized. Yeah. So we talked a lot a about kindred trading. spirit. So, yeah. But getting back to execing, mm. um, it was it was good. Mm. You know, uh, it was excellent experience. Uh, and you've got to start somewhere. You know, you have to, a lot of the time it ends up learning on the job, mm. you know, and that's what I did. And that's what most people do. That's what writers do. You learn and hone your craft by doing it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and it was, I was there for a couple of years, worked on some good shows, starting from scratch, 
you know. Um, yeah, it was good. And then I left. OK. Then you left mm. and took time out to raise your children. I'm going to drive you mad. No, I didn't. No, you didn't. I took, <laughs> I took time out for, you know, for various reasons. But mm. then I joined a um, film company. OK. Uh, to run the television arm of a film company. Ah, yes. So that was, that was very interesting because mm -hmm. it was an area that I hadn't worked in and film is completely different. I mean, the budgets for a start were breathtaking, mm. you know, it was monopoly money to me. Um, and yeah, so I stayed there a couple of years. So you've and gone then I took a break. No, at no, no. Last, so you've gone from there. a soap uh, into the film world. Mm. What's, what's the, apart from the budget, what's the big difference you two? Oh, gosh. I mean, and sustaining a 90-minute story, it's a completely different um, a challenge, mm. really. Uh, in actual fact, for me, because it was very much development, I um, found the pace very different because working on a long runner, you are working flat out. Mm. But what, what is amazing is what you work on gets televised. Mm. It will hit the screen. So you, you know, even if you make mistakes, you pick yourself up, you learn from those mistakes and you get back and you do the next episode. So it is an amazing skill and an amazing experience because no matter what you do, it is going to be out on screen. You know, yeah. it will be shown in millions of homes. Whereas film, I think, is fantastic, but it takes years to craft. And um, I found fun. it a very, very different pace. It was, it was a great experience, but mm. you know. What were some of the films you worked on? Oh, my goodness. And most of it was development. And, mm. I, and, and I shouldn't have been working on films. I was supposed to be um, developing television. But it was just, you know, I, we were always at a meeting mm. um, talking about films instead. It's very strange because most of the time I nodded and I smiled as I'm doing now, <laughs> not really understanding what anybody was saying. And then I would go home and I would literally read as many scripts as I could. I would research as much as possible, mm -hmm. learn um, very much about the budgets, how much everything was costing. So again, it was an education, Yeah, you know, a very um, strange education, but it was a good one. Okay. Now talk to me about the break you took. Oh, you want to know about the break? Do you? <laughs> I had kids. Congratulations. Believe it or not, I had kids. I mean, doing a show that is literally going out 50 weeks of the year, 52. It is, it is a punishing schedule. So it was, it was a break of pace. And um, actually, I decided for many reasons that I actually wanted out of the industry. And that... I hit, a, I hit the glass ceiling, mm -hmm. as a lot of people, and I couldn't quite see my way. I didn't know where I wanted to go next, but mm. I was sure as hell I wasn't getting there fast enough. So I threw a big strop and I said, no, <laughs> I stopped for some time. So Holby was great for me. I mean, I developed, that's not quite true. I mean, Lenny and I developed stuff together and um, I worked with other writers, mainly on development, but yeah. So going back to Holby was literally going back into the industry again and saying, I will do it differently this time. So how easy was it to come back having taken a break? Um, it wasn't easy, but I was incredibly lucky that I um, just literally knocked on doors and said, you've worked with me before. Can I come and do this? And, you know, they and said somebody yes. gave you a chance at mm. Holby, mm. which yeah. you turned into the success of the BAFTA. Yeah, that was an interesting... <laughs> yeah, again, it's a um, great challenge, Holby, because I, uh, for me especially, having a complete... I'm petrified of blood. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I mean, you know, I... It's not real, though, is it? No, it looks real. Trust me, it looks real. And, I, you know, I mean, I said, I can do this. It will be fine, as you do. And um, found myself on my first morning, I literally bumped into somebody who was covered with blood, um, an extra, you know, who had been made up for a kind of major trauma. And I literally rushed to the toilets and I thought, I'm going to be sick every single day. I actually perfected an art of being called away any time the surgeons were in instructing us on how to um, actually... Um, perform an operation. Mm -hmm. I was always away in the studio because what people don't realise with shows like that is that everything must be absolutely accurate. Mm. You do have advisors, you have surgeons on the day and, mo and um, theatre nurses mm. and you have to get absolutely everything spot on correct, mm. which is, you know, I mean, terrifying. 
So I have seen tracheotomies, open heart surgery. I have seen uh, a conjoined twins being separated. Oh. And actually, you know, the greatest battle for me was just literally getting over my fear. I mean, every single day I imagined that I had every illness in every episode. <laughs> but, um, so actually, it was. I felt the BAFTA was a reward for just staying with it. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what's that like, going up on stage, receiving the BAFTA for the work you've done, that you and your team have done? What does um, that mean to you? Um, again, it was a group effort. That Those particular episodes were, um, or that episode, was a challenge. It was a challenge in many, many ways. And so it was great to get to the end of it and actually have it recognised as a good episode and the show to be recognised for being in a fantastic place. I was working with a team that were hugely ambitious, mm. worked everyone until they dropped. But I mean, you know, writers were able to write stories that they hadn't written before. We spent every penny in the budget and more. Um, and it was, yeah, it was strange. I mean, on a personal level, I, I'm not somebody that particularly likes being in front of a camera, I say now, <laughs> with the cameras on. Um, so I found it slightly intimidating, if I'm honest. Um, but it was, a, it was a very, very interesting experience. The statues are incredibly heavy. I mm. didn't really realise that. <laughs> no, but I mean, seriously, it's great. It's great to have your efforts recognised. And it was fantastic to be on that stage with the writer who worked so hard, the director who gave absolutely everything, and the cast who, you know, week in, week out, will absolutely go that, you know, 101% to get it right. Mm. So you really do feel as if, as a team, you have worked so hard and you collectively are achieving something. And yes, I would like another one, thank you. <laughs> well, I was going to say, we're, we're going to go to questions from the audience mm. in a moment, but what difference do you think having the BAFTA made to you or has made to your career? Not a great difference, if I'm honest. Oh dear, I don't want to put anybody off. I mean, you know, it's it's great, but you still, the challenges still remain. You know, you're still looking for that brilliant script. You're still, you know, every project is different. It has its own challenges. Mm. Um, I guess in a way for me personally, it marks a point in my career. Um, but whether or not it's currency in terms of securing your next job, I think it probably is far more currency if you were a director mm. or a um, writer rather than a producer. But I don't want to sound bitter. Oh, no, I meant <laughs> pulling your leg. But, uh, sorry, I have to keep like It's great, you know, but I don't want to kind of talk it up beyond what it is, you know. Um, but it was a great night. Okay. First question from the audience. Would you just introduce yourself uh, when you ask your question and pop your question to Barbara? David. Uh, my name's David Say. I'm an Hi. actor, writer, director, film, aspiring filmmaker. Um, very, very inspiring to hear your story, um, particularly um, how you introduced a uh, South Asian family into EastEnders. And I, I just wonder um, why you think there's been hasn't been quite the same ease of being able to introduce something like a Chinese family into a long runner. Um, in the same way that when you said you introduced a, a South Asian family, it, it, it was, it was there, was, there were no barriers. It was a singing sheet. Everybody welcomed it and embraced it. And it was a, just a kind of normal mm. part of British cultural life. So, you know, why, why still? Um, 30 odd years after Chinese detective, um, is there such an invisibility of Chinese people on our, on our screens and television? And what can be done to try and overcome that? Okay, I'm going to be absolutely honest. I don't have the answer to the sure. first question. I sure. wish I did. Yeah. You know, um, it's about opportunity. I can only talk about EastEnders as, as it was when I was there and ran it. I don't think that there is a particular resistance to do it. I know the team there at the moment are fantastic, are working incredibly hard. Sometimes it's about stories, <laughs> and the stories are planned so far ahead, you know, that you work with the cast that you have. I, it worries me a huge amount that in you know on television in general that the Chinese community is not represented um, I think that writers have got to get out there and pitch great stories and 
I, th I know Lenny and I are very, very keen, and I am working with a couple of writers at the moment uh, on great stories, you know, from a Chinese perspective, you know. And I think it's, it's hugely important. I think now is the time. If anything, I'm going to be positive here, and I think now is the time to pitch those stories. I would, I would be very surprised if uh, the team on EastEnders wouldn't welcome a great story, you know, pitch it and see. But I think it is absolutely the time. Thank you. So. Sarah. Is Sarah at the back row? We don't have a Sarah. Ah, Rex. Hi. Um, Hi. My name's Rex, I'm a writer. Hi. Um, what would you think um, would change if EastEnders, Holby, uh, Casualty, the long-running soaps on BBC, um, if they didn't have, uh, if they had a, like a six-month rolling contract to be renewed every six months, rather than playing storylines in the year in advance, what would you think would change in the quality of the writing, of the quality of the programmes? Um, it's hard to talk about the quality, but the output would be very different and it would be very hard. What, when you've got a large cast like that, you literally need to be in production 50 w weeks of the year to be able to tell stories for all of them. So I think. My, my, sorry to interrupt. Mm, my cool. point being is that if you know that something's going, going to go on in two years' time, then there's a relaxedness, there's an ease, in a sense, maybe. Um, but if you know that everything that you write is probably going to be the last thing that you write, then maybe there might be a difference in that. What's your uh, thoughts? I it would just be a, a different animal. It really, really would be a different animal. And interesting enough, it's not my experience that there is an ease. Literally, to try and be in production 52 weeks a year, I can tell you, it is punishing. And what you find is that the teams change. So when you are there, you know that your time is finite. So what you try and do is make a, tell the best stories you can with the team you have. But your time is finite. You know, the, sh the show will continue, but you will not. So my challenges whilst I was there was, as I say, to reflect diversity on screen, to create some great characters irrespective, and um, tell some good stories. Um, and we did that, you know. But, and so honestly, I know it sounds really strange, but the pressure is on all the time. So the adrenaline high is all the time, you know. Uh, you don't you don't have or at least if they have a relaxed period I never had it mm -hmm. and with writers especially I think you know as a writer you are not if you've got other stories to tell if you want to write films if you want to write one-offs which most writers do you know that you will be there for a period of time and then you will move on so you tell the best stories you can but when it's your time to move on you move on so actually, it's almost like a self-imposed limitation on how long you'll be on the show. I mean, some writers do remain on the show and do incredibly well because it suits them. That medium suits them and the shows would not be able to, they would not literally, the output would cease if you could not depend on writers on a regular basis. But, you know, when I was on EastEnders, for instance, I'm, I know he won't mind me saying this, but Ashley Farrow, we sat down and we had a coffee and, we, and I said, you know, there will be a time, Ashley, where you will decide you want to move on because I already knew that there were other stories he wanted to tell. He and Matthew Graham and Tony Jordan, you know, they went on to write Life on Mars. Would they have done that if they hadn't had the discipline of running on, working on a long runner? I don't know. But to be honest, it's always pressurised. That's not to put anybody off, but, it, it, you know, it's quite exciting actually to know that for a writer you know within three months you are writing an hour or an hour's worth of programming it will go on, go out it will be shot it will be rehearsed it will be shot it will be edited and it will be out there so the pace is kept up to be honest so it would just my my opinion is it just would be a different show gentleman in the second row there Ian Hi. Thompson. Ian Hi. Um, I'm a writer-producer. Um, it's interesting that you um, mentioned that uh, Douglas Road Productions, is it, is going into um, more development rather than actual production. Um, my question is, is there a reason why do you think that there's not enough BAME 
independent television companies being commissioned by TV and the second part of the question basically is it due to the quality of the submissions or um, are there, there's, is the work not mainstream enough um, on the basis of, of that commission not happening? Um, I think in terms of answering the first question I think it's really hard to survive as an indie. It really, really is, whether you're BAME or not. And the fact that BAME are so underrepresented in the business, it is so hard to financially stay afloat long enough to get a commission. I think on a practical basis, that's why I've been working with Lenny and others to try and push for ring fence money. I believe that ring fence money will make the difference because actually then the output will be greater, you know, um, there will be sustainability. I think that's the first thing. For BAME, for all production companies, it's a struggle. But when there is such serious um, under-representation, so that you may be the only company, one or three, and may be, at that point, the only BAME company that has made that type of programming, so you're always, you know, the first, that's a struggle. So I, I think the economics really, really makes a difference. You know, and I think we need support, if I'm honest, so that there is a critical mass. Because what we want is a critical mass, because actually it's a creative industry. You do have to fail sometimes. For um, If you're in a minority, as we know, you always feel that you have to succeed. You know, if you fail, that's it. It didn't work. Well, no, what we want is a critical mass, you know, and we want sustainability. Now, anybody who's in an independent knows that that, you know, you need to be able to pay your bills for two, three years. How long does it take to develop a good drama? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the answer to the first question. The second question about quality, I think there's quality. I think there are writers out there. I think it's about um, your work landing on the table of the right person at the right time. Um, I hope that the, the industry is open now for a variety of voices telling different stories with universal appeal. It's just an interesting, sorry, interesting point there is that most of us has, that's worked in the industry for quite a while has basically seen the regression in terms of between the 70s and 80s where there were more BME people on TV. Yeah. I was fortunate to get two commissions unscripted in the past. Um, now that the regionals have come together under the ITV umbrella, all those opportunities now have just basically gone by the wayside and it's harder now for me, I feel, um, for BME um, independents to try and even get a look in. And I think, that personally, I think the landscape has changed drastically for the worse. I mean, well, what's your views on that? Well, I think it did. I mean, um, the, the skill set figures clearly reflected that uh, a year-on-year -year decrease of BAME representation. I don't think anybody can argue with that. That is absolute fact. You know, we're not making it up. Skill set did the That's census. Right, yeah. It is there for all to see. Every meeting I've been to with Lenny and Marcus Reiser, etc., talking to um, Secretary for Culture, that is a fact. Talking to skill set, that is a fact. What we do about it, hopefully, you know, um, uh, initiatives like the BBC Development Fund. I honestly hope it works. I honestly hope that people get access to it and that um, that makes a difference. I think that the imperative to find talented BAME writers, producers and on-screen talent now is greater because Sky have declared their 20%. I think the BFI three ticks. Um, we hope that Channel 4 will announce something soon that ITV will announce something soon. But if ever we're moving towards a more positive landscape, I think it's now. Mm. And I think what's important is that um, writers and producers, etc., must be ready. Barbara, you know. where, where are we with the Ring Fenced Money campaign? Could you bring us up to date? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, as I say, the, um, all the broadcasters are announcing initiatives. Mm. I think that ring fence money, we, look, none of us are naive, so we know that that's a big ask. But all I can say is we will keep pushing for it mm. and hope that even if we don't get the ring fence money, the broadcasters will come up with something that is an equivalent.
But so, my, sorry, you know, you. ultimately what we're looking for at the risk of repeating myself, and if any broadcasters are listening, we are talking about sustainability because as you say, we have had a regression. So what we've done in the past has not worked. The industry must recognize that in order to have proper representation, we need companies to be sustained for a period of time so that there is a critical mass of work, you know. And however that's achieved, I'm not sure, but we will keep pushing until, you know, something is in place. So, you know, I know that the BBC um, Development Fund is not the beginning or the end all, but at least it's the beginning, um, you know. And I, and I think what will be interesting is if enough practitioners apply for that fund, maybe if there are more practitioners than there is money, that will be an indication that there is more talent out there, therefore increase the fund, mm. you know. But I do think that Sky's 20% is a, is, is a real step forward. I think the BBC fund is a real step forward. Let's hope it's double next year. But I think this is the time, I'm being very positive, I'm not, I'm not naive, you know, and, and I would say that, and, you know, not going back to my own experiences, but I would just like to say that when I, seriously, the first time I walked on set as a newbie producer, I had to endure on-screen talent who decided to let loose their repertoire of stand-up racist jokes in front of the entire crew and all of the cast that were filming that day. I was on my own, there was no one else to look to, I dealt with it myself. So I do know what it's like to yeah, go into a room so, so. and hear terms that I would not have expected any educated person to use and combat that. Mm. And being a woman also was in another underrepresented group. I do mm. know what it's like. I'm positive, but I honestly have been there and dealt with it. So How, how you know. did you deal with that at the time? What did you do? Um, what did I do? I made a decision that I had worked very hard, six o'clock in the morning, I remind you, to train, so as not to let the opportunity go. And also, I was very aware that at the time, my, the head of department was afraid to actually appoint me, okay, and came under pressure to appoint me. And so I was not going to allow the show to be disrupted so what I did was very quietly say to the person who was delivering the jokes that they, I was giving them five minutes in which to lay out their repertoire. After that time, we got back to work and I reminded them of how much they had cost the production. And so I expected them to be word perfect, off the book and deliver. And that's what I did. And would you advise others well, first of all, do you think that sort of thing would be tolerated today? No, I don't think it would be tolerated today. Okay. And would you advise others how to deal with those sorts of things when and if they come up? Well, hopefully they won't come up, but I do know that writers sometimes are in situations where maybe they are getting feedback on their work and a lack of, maybe the person opposite them has a lack of knowledge or understanding of what they're reading and maybe that can come over as um, patronage. I think it's hugely important to keep an open mind, but as a writer especially, to stand firm on your work. If you have to explain the arena, explain the arena. I think sometimes I was saying to you, Eddie, when we spoke before, I think sometimes you go through a situation, I know I have, where I have decided to fit in. I have tried to be very low-key and to fit in, you know, and not make any waves. I mean, eventually I made waves anyway. But, you know, I mean, we all decide how we are going to approach things. I think that at, in this landscape, it's hugely important that people recognise their own USP. Okay, so I'm going to use the terminology. I think for writers, especially BAME writers who feel that they've been rejected a lot, they're not being heard, what you have, if you have 50 writers in the room, it's your unique selling point. And as someone who's always looking for original voices, 
use your original voice. Use your original voice. I am meeting somebody, a writer, um, in, a couple, in a week or two's time. They have the most unique voice that I have ever heard. And this came out of a conversation that I was having with an agent where I was musing on the fact that I wonder, I was trying to find a writer who had served 15 years in prison that I thought would be absolutely brilliant for a project. And they turned around and said, well, I've got just the person for you. I won't be indelicate about the person's background. But literally, you know, I think where you come from, your experiences, your perspective, that will form the stories you tell. And I think it's hugely important to celebrate that and be unashamed about that because actually in a room, there be, may not be anybody else that can rival your experience or, pers you know, perspective. David. I think using your USB is vital. Um, but I've also been on various training schemes where that was, that was taught to us, you know, celebrate your voice and your individuality but then um, during the course of the training scheme um, if there is something that's sort of slightly un unpalatable to the people who are in charge they will try to sort of mold you in a way that they feel comfortable in terms of the, the, sto the kind of story the way they would tell that version of, that, uh, of a particular story and and that seems to conflict with this idea of using your own USB or individuality. Mm. Sometimes, mm. sometimes certain stories perhaps are experienced in a slightly different way. Well, I think that's right, but that's always going to be the case, I think. You know, <laughs> if you're one company and you make one type of programming, you know, then that's what you're keyed into. That's what you're looking for. So somebody, if you're looking for high-end drama that's procedural, somebody who comes to you with a story that is very much for a um, indie film, it's not going to be your territory. Do, do you know what I mean? I mean, the one thing I would say, and I do say to writers, you know, it depends on what, if you want to write a novel, write a novel. Play, write a play. If it's television, then it's collaborative and you're talking about three to five million bums on seats. That has always got to be the ambition. So three to five million bums on seats, whatever story you, you want to tell, I think it literally has to be able to appeal, you know, you want universal themes. Sure. Universal themes that will reach, you know, the cast does not matter, mm. actually. Mm. It's universal themes. Even if Absolutely. you're opening a window, a door to a world that no one has ever seen, a universal theme will resonate wherever in the world you are. I think the other thing is, thank goodness, we are now coming to a point where um, programming should be global. The markets are different. And I think that people, program makers, broadcasters, whoever, who are literally continuously thinking about a domestic market, fine if it works for you. But there is a market out there which is very, very large. I give you an example of um, my partner has just made a project. It's not, it's not drama. But, you know, he proudly came back to say to me, it was sort of factual, that um, one of the teams that they were following, they were following a team, was tweeting 1.5 million followers in India. 1.5. Barbara, are the, do you think these new, the growth of new digital platforms mm. present opportunities for diverse writers? Yes. Yes, I do. And I think that is a fantastic area to be exploited. I genuinely do. I, you know, you're talking what about the global. What should people be doing? Well, I'm, it's, listen, I'm not an expert, but I think that one of the things that I'm doing, and I would suggest everybody does, is literally interrogate the digital platform. Mm. Start viewing, start watching, start um, researching, you know, and see where your work would fit. Mm. I think that companies will spring up. I think Amazon, I mean, amazingly, you know, people are posting their, their um, scripts. The audience will literally decide whether or not that script is, you know, commissioned. Um, I, I mentor a um, young director, producer, writer, Samuel Benter. I have done, you know, Samuel is reaching many, many people just on the, uh, on the internet. internet. You know, I mean, um, 
mandem on the wall are inspirational. Mm. Look, I couldn't produce it. I, you know, I'm, most of the time I'm looking and I'm thinking, this is funny, but I feel like an old, you know, what, <laughs> but admirable. You know, understand your, your audience, identify your audience and, you know, situations like this is fantastic i think colleges are very interested in collaborating now i think you know most people can get a camera out these days you know at the iphone mm. for god's sake people are actually filming on and upload it yeah. literally i would just upload it having started exploring the digital world we've got a question in from j ray villar on twitter who asks what's the best way to approach the long-term series market as a Portuguese Emmy winner writer, I'm finding it very difficult. To, sorry, to... I'll just have that question on. back again. Mm. Question is, what's the best way to approach the long-term series market? So we... They're Portuguese, uh, they're an Emmy winner, uh, oh. they're a writer, but finding it difficult. And they want to get into writing long-term series. So, I mean, well, there's a difference if it's long runner, which mm. I'm assuming it's not, um, you know, an established not long runner. I mean, mm. it sounds as if the person, the writer is, will generate original content. Mm. Um, I think it is identifying, if it's over here, we're talking about identifying the companies, the production companies who specialize. There are, you know, I mm. mean, look, Left Bank, you know, three, four so series cool. of Strike Back, Project Door. You know, again, it's about doing the homework. Mm. I think because we're in such a competitive environment, I know it's very boring for writers, and I, I hate saying this, but I really think it is important to research your market. Mm. Don't leave it to your agent. You know, look at the output. Look at the output. You like something, check out who made it, who wrote it, who produced it. Contact that company, you know. Also, I mean, it depends. It very much depends on where the writer is. But I would say Emmy winner, Portuguese, you know, there are um, distribution companies now mm. who are going into the market themselves that are going, making, you know, going into scripted content. Yeah. Contact them, be brave, contact them, you know, let them know who you are, you know, an Emmy win winning Emmy writer. Winning writer. Um, go for it, I would say. OK, we've got another question from Twitter. Victoria says, do you have any advice for budding BAME writers? I do hate that phrase. And producers who want to break into the industry? There's a nice broad question oh, for you. That is a nice broad <laughs> question. Um, what are the first steps people should take? They've watched something on TV. They think, actually, I can write or I, I've got a good mark at school or something. Mm. What's the first steps people should I mean, should it's re I, you know, I hate to say this, but you can't be too prescriptive because mm. everybody has a different journey. I think that one of the things I would say is have your, what I call, and there's a writer in the audience who will be smiling when I say this, your calling card. I think when you work on a script and you work incredibly hard to write your first script and no one's paying you, make sure it's the best it could possibly be. So that when you go to a meeting with a producer, script editor, development person, that when you leave that script, when you send that script, it is the best it can be. So you need to hone and craft that script. So one of the things that I would say is to take advantage of any initiatives that are out there. You may not. I think it's really hard because writers get into this um, vicious cycle where they are seeking the commission and the commission becomes the ultimate. I think. Before that, it's about getting people to read your work. So submit it. The BBC Writers Room, great. It doesn't work for everyone, but if it works for you, submit it, get feedback. What you want is feedback so that you can keep honing your craft and your script. There are um, some fantastic courses that may run just for a weekend. Make sure that the people teaching on the course have actually commissioned themselves and know what commissions are looking for. Mm. I'm not being rude, but you know, and are current. That's another way of getting help to craft your script. You know, if you have an agent, make sure they give you feedback. Mm -hmm. So what you actually want is feedback. So when you, even if it's a rejection, if the rejection is, you know, says I love your characters and the world you created, but it's not for us, engage. Mm -hmm. You know, write back and say thank you so much. When you submit your script, don't ask for a commission, ask for feedback on your work. Then you're actually having a relationship, yeah. you're engaging, if the person at the other end actually likes your work and knows that you are open to feedback, a relationship 
a more open relationship will develop. Those relationships pay off at the end. Okay. Let's go to the audience. We've got about 10 minutes left. The lady in the front row here. Sorry, your name is? Hello, my name is Vibrine Sandy Hi. and I'm a non-fiction author. Ah. Um, so just uh, following on from what you've just said, so I'm at the uh, new end of the spectrum. So I'm interested in how would I go about transitioning if I wanted to write uh, for a soap or, or to get more into drama writing? So in terms, you've just mentioned the script, for example. Mm. Does that have to be a full-length script? Could it be a synopsis? Does it, is it 10 pages? Um, um, ultimately, I think it's great to have a lot of ideas, but ultimately what somebody needs to read is a script because it's the visual medium and a script editor, producer, whatever, needs to know that you can write dialogue, that you can set up char well-rounded characters plot, you know, pace, tone, these things can only be demonstrated when... It's written down. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's whatever medium, you know, or genre mm -hmm. um, is comfortable for you. You know, try a 30-minute if it's comedy or try a, a, you know, a film script. Right. You know, you can progress. Mm -hmm. But actually reading a 50-minute script, if the dialogue is fantastic, the dialogue is fantastic. You know, it may not be that someone can commission you for an hour's drama on a 15 minute script, but at least it will give a good indication of your writing style. But ultimately, that's the only way I could judge. Okay. It's a fully developed script. Lady in the front with a wrap. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name's Carol Russell and I am a writer. And just wanted to say to you, there are lots of services out there because Barbara's right, if you get somebody who can read your work and give you feedback on that work, that will actually really help you progress and move forward. Doing it on your own, you know, and kind of locked in your, in your bedroom, <laughs> yeah. in your little garret, with your, or yeah. on your laptop. Yes. That, you, you, you can get only so far, yeah. and then you need... The exposure. Absolutely. To, to be and there are services, online services, good ones, who will read your script and give you what Barbara would call coverage on the script that you've sent them so that you can you can continue to improve because that a bit apart from having your script produced that's the next best thing in terms of learning what works and what doesn't and do i have to have an agent at this no. stage or not so no. it's just about creating it mm -hmm. and then submitting it getting feedback absolutely can i also say and it's something i forgot but um really try and do some research and find out all the possibilities to get financial assistance to go on courses to do these things so skill set <coughs> absolutely i think at the moment skill set are keen and eager to help and promote bame talent okay. i think it's absolutely worthwhile going on their website mm -hmm. interrogating it contact them the more bame talent that actually access skill set and the funds available will prove that we are out there that there is talent there and will define what else is ring fenced, what other facilities and um, initiatives are. And there is a diversity are, yeah. uh, bursary. That's right. right. Now. Inside skill set. Inside yeah. skill Please set. go on the website oh, and have a look yeah. because mm -hmm. there is a certain amount of money that is, is ring fenced and it would be great if people actually take advantage mm -hmm. of it. You know, because we all know how hard it is to sit in your room with no money, no income and create. It is a hell of a challenge. Just picking up that question and also the one from the Portuguese writer. Mm. Uh, in terms of pitching to a long runner, would that is the process for that procedure for that normally through your, one's literary agent rather than yourself? Well, th there must be a. a, a it depends. They, they can't every, be open every, to every any submission. Every um, broadcaster has a different. Really? Yeah. They're all different because, you know, I mean, BBC will function differently to ITV. And honestly, I think that it isn't that people want to keep the door closed. It's just that they are working 18 hours a day. They're trying to hit their, their you know, targets. Contact. Literally look at the credits and look at story consultant. Look at for the story producer. Look for a name and contact. You know, BBC, I know it's writer's room. Um, I'm not sure, you know. I mean, there's bound to be a, an avenue um, at Channel 4. Uh, it literally is doing that. And ask everyone. 
that's the other thing. I think we don't talk to each other enough. You know, I mean, TV Collective is a fantastic, um, you know, website. Actually pose your questions. Simone will respond. That's another thing. I think it's a fantastic uh, facility. Pose your questions. If enough people are asking the same question, there will be a response. So how, how effect, how, sorry, you've got another question. Mm, go um, so you've just mentioned in terms of exploring broadcasters. So um, if I wanted to approach a, a, um, a series directly, mm. would it be prudent to do that? So for example, if I wanted to approach Holby or mm. EastEnders or Corrie or, mm. any, or any other is, program, you what's know, the protocol? It's really, really difficult. What I have to say, I know it may not be pleasing to hear, but my fear for a lot of writers is that they jump over certain processes and want right. to go. You've just told me that you're making the transition. <coughs> what I'm going to say to you is what I love is for someone to read your work. Yes. You need to be ready. It is not a joke being commissioned to deliver that hour. Yeah. It really yeah, is incredibly hard. I think it's much better to be nurtured to go through so that you are absolutely ready. I cannot tell you how many writers would come to the show and they've done a hell of a lot and then all of a sudden they've got to learn the medicine. You were talking about shooting in a very short space of time, turning scripts around within sometimes days. Yeah. You know, that pressure is not something that you want to put yourself under and then fail because if the writer cannot keep the pace, it's not about the ability of the writer to write. It's about the pace and the pressure, you know. So when you're ready, it is much better to be overconfident, yes. frankly, than underconfident. And I think, um, again, I noticed at the um, London Film Festival that's coming up at the moment, actually Simon Harper, who runs Holby, is one of the speakers. The great to, as it, oh, is it gone? Oh, what a shame. I mean, just keep, keep an ear out, but honestly what you want is feedback. What is so important is feedback on your work, you know, and be open to that feedback. You know, if someone says, you know, loving your characters, but I'm a bit concerned about the authenticity or it's the pace or it's the structure, you can work with that because you're ever developing, you're ever crafting. And the other thing, don't forget, is that those shows may not suit everyone. You know, sometimes yeah. writers have stopped laughing, Carol Russell, um, she knows because I said this to her. Um, your writing may not suit that platform. That is no indictment of your talent. Mm -hmm. You know, it is just that for some people, it's the original. They need to originate every character and situation themselves. That is fine. You know, sometimes it is about some people flourish in a 90 minute. You know, they will write a film, but they do, are not comfortable writing a six-parter. It's what's comfortable for you at the time. And obviously the idea, does it lend itself better to a, a, a film than a series? Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. So that's what I would say. David. One last thing. Go on. Read scripts. And the BBC Writers' Room mm. is a really good um, archive to yeah. go and read okay. scripts so you know what the format looks like. You understand how the storytelling works yes. in that form. Do you, do you see what I mean? I do. Thank you. David. You mentioned earlier about um, global audiences mm. creating other opportunities, other platforms. And I wonder how one deals with certain cultural gatekeepers who might respond to a story and say, yes, okay, it's, it's, it involves a lot of British characters, but the lead character is from a different country and therefore is not British enough. So how, how, how does one go back to that kind of response? Because if it's a universal story, it's a universal story. Mm. And you know, some characters are from here, some characters are from somewhere else, but if, if, the, if the gatekeeper's attitude is, is one that the lead character has to be British in order to be relevant to a, a UK viewing audience, then they're kind of missing out on the global market. So how does one, how does one kind of come back to something like that, that kind I of provincial think, thinking? I think you can't ch change the, no. um, 
the vision of a company, they know how they're being funded. You yeah. find a different company. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in all honesty, if they are looking for a very British project and you have a global yes. project. So for me, I think sometimes it's well worth putting the ambition of the project in the pitch document. You know. I'm just going to intervene there because we've got a response from J. Ray Villa who says, thank you guys. Sometimes Twitter doesn't give us many characters to explain ideas, but Barbara gave me the good advice. So thank you very good. much. Good. I'm oh. really pleased. Yeah, so we'll wrap it up there. So thank you very much to our audience. Thank you very much to Ravensbourne for here. And thank you. Can we have a small round of applause for Barbara Emile? <laughs> thank you very much. And just to say um, that uh, thanks to the staff and everyone here, we will be having a lunch with somebody from Kudos, I think, in the weeks to come. So check the uh, TV Collective website uh, just to let people know about that. Uh, it will be I, uh, Daniel Isaacs. He's the Chief Operating Officer for Kudos Film and Television. More details coming through the website. Thank you all again. Good night. <laughs>